Welcome from the First Presbyterian Church in Burbank. We're glad you're here. Let's join the service now and hear the proclaiming of God's Word. Uh, the scripture this morning comes from Acts chapter 19. And as you know, that this, since June, we've been walking through the book of Acts. Um, we're already up to 19. And please send the kids out. Is the Yes, right? The, kid, the kids could go with Mr. Hamill. Yes, thank you. And it's your last chance if you want to go. Big kids too. You could leave now if you want. Just kidding. Bye, you guys. Bye, B. See ya. So as you know, we've been walking through the book of Acts since the month of June. And we continue to really ponder and to listen to the word that describes and talks about what it means to do mission together. What it means to be the church together in the world. What it means that when we say we follow Jesus, that we respond to that call to go out and to actually do something. Um, Again, hear the word from the Lord, um, from the scripture, hear the word of the Lord from chapter 19. Beginning at verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Verse 8, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. This is the word of the Lord, friends. Thanks be to God. Again, like I said, we've been walking through the book of Acts. We're up to chapter 19 now and we will, uh, up to Advent, uh, hopefully we will get through at least most of the book of Acts, if not, maybe come back another time. But This idea that the church is a place that uh, God sends his people out. You come every single Sunday, uh, you sit in the pews, and again, we've talked about this a lot, what it means to move from being just participants, uh, excuse me, being spectators to becoming participants, uh, becoming, you know, sitting in a pew to actually getting up and going out. This entire book is about the acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit working in your life. And just in chapter 19 alone, we get that kind of question, that, that thought of, for us, if you listened to the text, do we believe in God's Spirit? Do we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, that God is able to use us and do great things? Sometimes I think, and I said this in the first service, sometimes I think that, uh, at least me, I love going to places like Soup Plantation or places where there's a big buffet, you know, the tendency as followers of Christ, we get to that uh, big buffet, that big, uh, you know, different things and peppers and dressings and meat and this, and we pick and choose what we want. You know, I, maybe you don't like mushrooms, but you pick out and put the peppers. You, maybe you don't like beets, which I hate, and you put something like green onions or something else. Sometimes we do that as Christians. And I think in the story today that we hear about Paul in Ephesus, we get a glimpse and really Paul asking the church the question, well, did you fully get the message that you heard from John the Baptist? We know in the story that Paul takes us back, the writer of Acts, Luke, takes us back to that place in Matthew chapter three with John the Baptist. We know John's job back then was to point people to the way, to show them. He was like the pointer. He would say, look over there. Someone ahead of me, that guy up there, 
He's going to be the one who's going to help. He's going to be the one that's going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. My baptism, and I'm paraphrasing, forgive this, it's all about repentance. So Paul's big question to the men that he met in, in the city of Ephesus was, did you fully get the message? So do you believe today, brothers and sisters, in the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that God is able to do great things in your life? Big things that kind of stand out that I want us to think about this morning. If you're sitting in church today, if you're thinking, maybe I didn't get the full message at one point in my life. Maybe I'm not quite there. Casey, Ross, Dave, everybody, you know, I come here, but I'm not quite sure yet that I fully believe in this Jesus that you keep telling me about. And I want to say that that's okay that you're here then, that you're asking questions, that you're really trying to figure out what it means to be a Christ follower. But the big difference in the story today that I want us all to hear is that John's baptism, one commentator writes, is it's almost like uh, he twisted their arms. It was by force. We know in today's world that if you force the gospel down people's throats, there's a good possibility they're not going to listen. If you twist their arms and try to make them believe in Jesus, there's a really good possibility they're not going to pay attention to you. So how do you live your life out as Christians in the world, outside the walls of this church, in the community, with your friends, in the relationships that you have? Because remember, if you're walking with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's in your life. Um, 99% of the work is done. This is in my own belief and opinion. If you're living and walking in Christ, really showing up. When I was going into ministry, there was a pastor that said to me, um, I took a small church up in the Antelope Valley that many of you know about, and he said, Casey, 99% of being a pastor is showing up. So I think as followers of Christ, showing up in people's lives, showing up in those places where people are broken, listening with our ears to the stories that people have to share. You know, we stink at listening, right? We're too busy with our phones, and I fall short of this. We're not very good listeners. Paul's work in Ephesus really is an example of his faithfulness and not giving up that he was going to continue to teach no matter what. The text says he spent time for three months in the synagogue debating and discussing. I could hear it now, arguments taking place. Have you ever shared your faith with someone in a way where you shared with them truly what it is that you believed and had an argument, you know, that you debated whether or not something was true. Somebody in this beautiful church of ours, that wonderful, awesome young adult, asked me a question, and I went and asked Pastor Ross, you know, does Adam and Eve have a belly button? Did you hear that? Does Adam and Eve have a belly button? You can laugh now, but it's a question. You should be able to ask questions. You know, you should be able to talk about those things. You should be able to have debates, if you will. You know, all these talks, all these conversations that Paul was having in the synagogue led to a point where he said, I'm done, I'm moving on. He got out of the synagogue in the stories that says, you guys didn't laugh at the belly button question? I laughed. (laughs) Oh, anyway, all right. He, He goes out into the hall of Tyrannus, a philosopher, He continues what he was doing in the synagogue, and again, this shows Paul's faithfulness in not giving up and presenting the gospel to people outside that space called church. He goes into the hall of the philosopher of Tyrannus for another two years, the scripture says, and he continued to to, to debate. He continued to have conversations. Everybody that he met and everybody that he baptized in the story continued to be with him in that time. And the text says, all Jews, all Greeks heard the word of the God. Now, there's a point in the, in the context of that time where in Ephesus, people usually, and again, this one story I read, people usually uh, would work in the morning and work at night. So Paul, in this hall, if you will, it was like one of our community halls here in the city, Paul would go into the hall from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. and taught every single day. Everybody that was um, with him, everybody that he ministered to, continued to be with him as he taught the word. And the scriptures say that they heard of the word. They heard the word. They heard the word of the Lord. God did 
extraordinary miracles because of what Paul was doing each and every day. Now, one of the reasons Paul had that um, space from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. was because people worked late at night, people worked in the morning, and Paul and the believers at the time thought, well, we're going to take advantage of the time we have as community, as people of God, as the believers, and we're going to be up when everybody else is sleeping. We're going to be up listening to our teacher and pastor, Paul. God did extraordinary miracles, verse 11 says, through Paul. It's not by our hands, the scripture says. It's by God's hands. It's not by what we do in the life of the church, our agendas, our ideas of what church should be like, our ideas of how we should care for people, but it's by God's hands. The scripture really brings out that the fact that it wasn't by Paul's hands that he did these miracles, but it was by God's hands. So what's that say about the scripture this morning? That if we are living and walking in the spirit, that God can use you and me to do extraordinary things. That God can use you and me to go to places like Paul did. Paul went, Paul went to where the people were at. Paul went to those places that other people maybe don't go to. Paul spent time with people who had questions. Paul spent time with those who debated and wondered what this and who this Jesus was and this faith that Paul kept talking about. So when you're walking in the Spirit, when you're walking and living in Christ, God can use you to do extraordinary things. They might not be, and I talked about this in the first service, my work as a chaplain, there are moments that where I might get a call in the middle of the night, and probably the, the hard ones for me, it's when I get a, a call that a baby is dying, you know, when, when a baby's struggling. Or, um, and I go and I show up, and, and the first thing they say to me when I walk into, the, into that particular unit in the hospital, um, the nurse says, can you please pray? I've had that more than one occasion. Can you please pray? And I'm thinking, sure, I can, but in my prayers sometimes, and, and again, I, I don't know about you, Lord, please do something now. The reality is, is that when we follow Jesus and the way you pray and the way you live your life according to the scriptures and in the spirit, as we're learning from this morning, that your prayers, that the ones that you pray, so I can pray for that baby, please, Lord, please heal this baby. And on that particular occasion, it was a set of triplets that would eventually go home to God. But that day, and I was blown away, the mom and dad that were there that day, and I'm remembering it from that moment, that um, they both were believers. So they were super grateful for the prayer. But I'm thinking, Lord, I have nothing to give. There's nothing I can say in that moment. There's nothing I can do. It's like, Lord, please do and work your power, make this, whatever it is, and just make these babies well. When we follow Jesus and we're doing God's work and when the church is doing its best work, sometimes you might not see those prayers come to fruition. You might continue to pray. The scripture says that Paul laid his hands on them. That you might pray for a broken relationship. You might pray for somebody in need. You might not ever see the answered prayer. You know, who knows? But because of your faithfulness and not giving up, because of your faithfulness to that relationship, to that broken relationship, to the baby that needs prayer, to the mom and dad that are needing prayer that night, to whatever situation that you find yourself in, that you were faithful people, that you prayed. You know, Hebrews 4.16 says this, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Another prayer scripture says boldness. That when you approach the throne of grace with your prayers, that you're bold. The scripture says that Paul was bold in his teaching. That Paul wasn't ashamed of his teaching. That he told people about Jesus. Now, the, the passage highlights that John's baptism was one of repentance and that Jesus' baptism was good news that when we're out in the world in relationships with people, people that we work with every single day, whoever it might be, that the way you're presenting the gospel is in a way that shows the grace of God. You know, Romans 8 says, there is no, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That you're not doing this. You're not pointing at people and judging them and criticizing them. 
excuse me, forgive me for pointing, but I'm just, you get the point, that you're not putting them down. That the gospel that Paul was trying to present was one of grace, the kind of grace that brings freedom, that releases us from sin. These extraordinary miracles that we hear in the scriptures all through the book of Acts up to chapter 19. Back in Acts, the beginning of Acts, the writer highlights the fact that Jesus rose from the grave, the miraculous resurrection, if you will, that he appears after the resurrection. Acts chapter two, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the 12 apostles. It was accompanied by wind and fire and speaking in tongues. Later on in the book of Acts in chapter two, many miracles were performed by the apostles. Peter healed the lame man at the temple in chapter three. God answered Peter in a miraculous earthquake, excuse me, in chapter four. Ananias and Sapphira were slain by the Lord in chapter five. Signs and wonders continued to be done by the apostles. Peter healed many from various cities later on in chapter five. Prison doors were opened by an angel. Stephen wrought great wonders and signs in chapter 6. In Samaria, Philip did great miracles and signs. Later on, the Lord appeared to Saul, but Saul is unsaved until he responds to the preaching of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. The good news, not the bad news, not the critical news, except Jesus now, but the good news of the gospel. That he responds to the good news of the gospel in chapter 9. Ananias was the preacher. Ananias healed Saul's blindness later on in chapter 9. Later on in chapter 9, Peter healed Ananias. And Jaffa, Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. Cornelius, later on in the book of Acts, saw an angel. He and his entire family spoke in tongues, but he was saved by the responding of the preaching of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. The gospel, the good news. Peter saw a vision on the roof and spoke. Remember the sheets that came down? Peter saw the vision on the roof and spoke with the Lord in chapter 10. Later on in chapter 12, a prison gate was miraculously opened. Paul, Paul blinded by Elymas in chapter 13. Paul performs miracles in Iconium later on in chapter 14. Later on in chapter 14, Paul heals a crippled man at Lystra. Paul healed a woman possessed by an evil spirit in chapter 16. The miraculous earthquake that unloosened all the chains. Remember that? God loosens chains. God sets people free. A miraculous earthquake where God unloosens all the chains and the doors opened up in the Philippian prison in chapter 16, almost to chapter 19. In Ephesus, 12 men spoke in tongues and prophesied. Paul performed other miracles in Ephesus. And the scripture says extraordinary miracles. When the church is doing its best work, when the church is working and they're sharing and they're talking and they're not making it about them, they're making it about the good news of the gospel, not twisting people's arms, not putting their politics in the way, not saying this is all about me, but making it about Jesus. When the church is doing what the church is supposed to be doing, uh, God can do extraordinary things with normal minions and people like us. People who think, we think sometimes, and I do this, I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to give. I'm broker than a skunk. My relationships, whatever it is, whatever you're thinking, I have a broken marriage. I have this. I have that. I struggle with drugs or mental illness or addiction or I'm not smart or I can't speak. Whatever it is, God can use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Amen? A little louder, people. Amen? There you go. God can use ordinary people like you and me to do great things, but the missing key that Paul tried to communicate was you need the Holy Spirit in your life. You need to be living by God's Spirit. It's not by your own hands. I love in this passage, and and again, thank you for being patient, things that Paul had touched, the people around him took those garments and took them to others Because, again, that power, that spirit that was flowing from Paul, they believed, even if we could just take this garment, this handkerchief, this apron, they will be healed. So God uses our lives in ways we don't even realize. God uses you in moments and times and spaces at work and relationships when you're not even paying attention. The scripture says that their illnesses were cured. People's, People's lives are changed 
by the way you live your life outside the walls. People's lives are changed when you're not even looking, like I said, by the way you walk and talk at work, that you're not gossiping on social media, that you're not sending text messages and you're not doing this and you're not wasting your time, that you're actually looking at somebody eye to eye, being intentional, paying attention to them, because the gospel of good, the good news of the gospel requires you to have your eyes wide open to being paying attention to those things and people and their problems and their issues. We're too busy squinting and looking down. You have to have your eyes opened to see the Spirit of God work and do great things. People's lives are changed by the way you live. It, it, the scripture says evil spirits left them. Back in Matthew, we know that in chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus speaks and Satan leaves. After the third time of being tempted, Jesus speaks and the enemy leaves. That when you're living and following Jesus with Christ in your life and the Spirit of God working in your life, evil disappears. Darkness becomes light. When you show up, there's this, you know, because of how God is using you and lives in your life, when you show up in places that are dark, all of a sudden it's bright. So God's power is awesome. Scripture says the evil spirits left them. Almost done, I promise. When we give our hands to God, asking him to work through us, he will and he has, and he has, according to Pastor Ross, since like 1887, he's used this church. He's used this community of faith. Now, in uh, getting ready and preparing to become a minister, there was something that I had learned in church polity, the book of order and the way we govern as a Presbyterian church, things like that. But there's something that has stuck with me since the day I got ordained as a minister. Even if the walls of the church fall down, the walls where we wrote all of our blessings, even if the entire church disappears, those who follow Jesus, those who've committed their lives, as scripture says, to the way, those who follow Jesus, those who have committed their lives to Christ, the church remains, the church continues. So when the trumpet blows on that day and you go home, whether or not this church is still standing here another hundred years from now, the church of Jesus Christ will remain. Whatever agenda that we've debated over for the last bazillion years, gone, but the people of God who are remaining faithful to the good news of the gospel and not punching people in the face and twisting their arms saying, you need Jesus now or you're going to die. When you've been faithful and you're intentional and you're looking at them in the eye, the church of Jesus Christ is going to do great things through you and your hands. Not your hands, but God's hands. But God's hands are going to use you to do great things. He will, he has, he's going to continue to use you. And even if you decide one day the Lord's calling you to another place, another job, another whatever it might be, God's going to continue to use you. This last part here, Jews and Greeks heard the word because Paul went. Everybody heard the word because they got up. I mean, Paul got up and went. He was sent. When you get up and leave and you go spend time in those places that God has called you to, the difficult places in your life, whatever it might be, that God uses you, that people will hear you, people will listen, lives will be changed. Your ordinary life, my ordinary life, God will use it in extraordinary ways. And yes, miracles. Miracles are real. We might not have, I've never seen somebody get out of bed at St. Joe's and say, ta-da, all is well. I've never, in about 10 years I've done chaplaincy. But I hope and pray to God that there's one person that maybe in the middle of the night, whether or not it was because of my prayer or someone else's prayer. I've seen doctors who've been beautiful people come in and hold hands and sit with their patients and listen to them and nurses who are more, or just can't even explain the powerful presence of a nurse in a patient's life. I've witnessed it with my own eyes. So maybe those are the miracles, you know, that God's people aren't giving up, that we sit with people and there's stuff that we don't give up that believers, as the scripture says, they remain faithful for two years, don't give up. The worst feeling in the world, friends, and all of us maybe have been on 
that other side is when we get a glimpse that believers give up, when people lose hope. It's the worst feeling when a believer senses that you guys have given up. You know, the church is going to continue. I'm not giving up. I hope you guys don't give up. It's not about numbers. It's about people. And we can do great things. Nothing is impossible with God. Amen? Luke chapter 1. Nothing is impossible with God. Say it with me as we close. Nothing is impossible with God. If you leave today believing and thinking that, gosh, I can't do that. I can't preach like Pastor Ross. I can't teach Bible study like Terry. I can't do any of that stuff. Uh, You know, why am I here? If you keep thinking that way, there's a good possibility that you're not going to be paying attention to what it is that the Spirit is telling you to do that day. So stay in tune. Be present. If we had another two hours of preaching and sermon, Ross and I would tell you about the ways you can add that to your life, but we don't. Nothing is impossible with God, though, when you're walking with Christ. Your hands will be used. Good things will happen. To God be the glory. Amen. And let me pray, and I want to show you something um, in preparation for the holiday season. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for good news that the gospel that you have given us um, is one to be celebrated with joy and thanksgiving. And indeed, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we know that today we don't hear you condemning us, that we hear good news, grace and mercy. And Lord, we want to be the kind of church that does indeed get up from the pews and goes outside and the kind of church that looks for opportunities to be in relationship with the stranger and our neighbor and our coworker. Lord, uh, help us believe that your spirit residing in us. Even the scriptures say that you go ahead of us to remind us and to nudge us of those things that we already know to be true in our hearts, Lord. That give us opportunities to do that this week, we pray. Give us opportunities to talk about the hard things to hear questions that whether or not they're funny or deep or difficult or painful, to talk about the faith, our faith that you've given us, Lord, with others. Maybe who might not understand. Maybe people who would say they would never show up to a church. But Lord, help us to be open and be intentional of of digging deep with friends and neighbors and those who are hurting. And God, as we move forward this week, we pray that, uh, again, we all would love to be like Paul. to to be faithful and uh, persevere and not give up and not to be ashamed. Lord, even if we could just be a tad like him this week, Lord, help us to do that. Help us to be uh, the people that that you have called us to be. Help us to be people who take risks. Help us to be that church that really makes a difference, not with programs, not with numbers, but because we told people about good news, about your love. So we thank you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. We also invite you to join us to worship in person on Sunday mornings. We have services at 915 and 1115. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you.